بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حق ومرزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطل ومرزقنا اجتنابه وبعد respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I pray all of you are well insha'Allah ta'ala and having a fruitful Ramadan in the last few days and nights of this blessed month of Ramadan al-Mubarak may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our worship and accept whatever we are able to carry out in terms of ibadah in this particular month uh, and I also would like to. It's gone off. I think I would like to. Okay. Should have stopped. Yeah. And I would <clears throat> also like to thank Al Balagh Academy for organizing this very important uh, seminar today or webinar, as we like to call it, relation to Eid al Fitr. I have a few issues that I want to inshallah discuss with all of you today. This uh, topic and this webinar in relation to Eid, which we shall inshallah ta'ala be celebrating in a day or two or three days or four days or how many days, wherever you are in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted and give us, given us Muslims a day which is called the day of Eid, which is a day of celebration. And not just this Eid, but another Eid as well, which is called Eid al-Adha. So this is Eid al-Fitr and the other is Eid al-Adha. And these are two celebrations, two days that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the believers. And in relation to this, why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us these two days? What is the concept behind Eid al-Fitr? What is the concept behind Eid al-Adha? But today we're going to inshallah focus on Eid al-Fitr. But what is the concept behind this? Why do we have Eid? You see, if you look at other faiths, and other religions, they have certain days of celebration in their faith. And they have more than one. Some, some faiths have like five, some have six. And they are based on a certain historical event that took place in their history. So for example, the Christians, they have Christmas, one of their celebrations, they have Easter and many others, but they have Christmas which is based on, according to their understanding, on the birth of Jesus, peace be upon him, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. They think he was born on 25th of December. Uh, likewise, other faith communities as well, it's based on certain events that have happened in the history, where, whether it's to do with someone's birth or whether it's an achievement or whether it's some uh, miracle that took place or some historical event took place. It's based on something that occurred in the history. Whereas Islam is different. The two major Eid days that we have been given as a form of celebration, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, this is based on one's own celebration. It's not based on something that happened previously. It's not based on an his historical event. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted, he could have made the day of Eid on a date which corresponded with something that happened in the history. Eid could have been based on, let's say, the birth of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or it could have been Ascension, Mi'raj. These are like major, major issues and major historical, like great events in the history of Islam. Or the Battle of Badr, the day the Muslims had victory in the Battle of Badr, the day the Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina, the day of Hijrah, or, you know, the, when the first verses of the Quran were revealed, Iqra' bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Many, 
many events in our history, and like major events, our history is filled. And especially in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every day was, was a major day. But there are, you know, really important occurrences. So our Eid al-Fitr, the major Eid celebration, the major celebration we have as Muslims, could have been based on something that happened in the past. Yet Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala chose that Eid day should be a day wherein Muslims, not forgetting their historical events, not undermining them and not overlooking them, rather everything's because of all of these things that happened in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in our history and even after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, Islam is saying that if you want to celebrate, then you must celebrate on your own efforts, not on the efforts of the past. It's like, you know, someone just sits there and say, look, my forefathers and my grandfathers did this and you know my great great granddad did this and my forefathers they, they were they did this yes we remember them whatever and you know we respect them and but Allah is saying that the Eid al-Fitr is celebration is not what they did it's about what you did what have you done have you earned a day to celebrate and this is why Eid al-Fitr is based on one's own effort not on the efforts and the achievements of people in the past. Uh, you, know, it can, you know, even in sports, sometimes, you know, people, they just keep on talking about the history. They say there's some, you know, football, soccer, you might know it, or football. There were some teams who were very, very uh, successful in the past. So people always say to them that, look, you guys just talk in the 1970s, in the 1960s, in the 1950s, or like England, for example, they just talk about the World Cup that they won. 1966, like still remembering 1966, do something yourself. So this is what Islam is saying, that Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, these two major Eids that have been given are based on our own achievements. Eid al-Fitr, well, I'll come to Eid al-Fitr. Eid al-Adha is based on the great achievement of Hajj and everything related to Hajj. The Muslims have gone from across the world, they've sacrificed their wealth, their time, their energy, and, you know, even those who are not going for Hajj, but they are also supporting people who are going to perform Hajj, people in their families are going for Hajj and spending time in Mina, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then on Arafah day, the main day of Hajj, that's when you complete Hajj and you have basically achieved something. So the next day, Allah gives this day of celebration, celebrating the great achievement of Hajj. Likewise, what we're talking about today is Eid al-Fitr. Eid al-Fitr is basically a day of celebrating the achievements of Ramadan. So basically, Eid al-Fitr is not really a physical celebration. I mean, it manifests itself in a physical way. Of course, we become happy, etc. We wear our good clothes, and I'm going to talk about some of these things in Eid Salah, etc. But really what we have to understand that Eid al-Fitr is really a spiritual celebration. Why are we celebrating? Celebrating because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted us the tawfiq and the ability to worship him in Ramadan. We performed taraweeh salah, qiyamul layl, tahajjud. We fasted, fasted for 29, 30 days. We recited the book of Allah. We stayed away from sins. We basically gave up our, we sacrificed and we gave up our wants and needs like to drink water and eat and engage in halal relationships. But all of this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one month. We sacrificed all of this. So Allah said that the, this whole month that you've sacrificed, here's a day for your great achievement. And this is a day for you to celebrate. So this is what Eid is all about. And Eid al-Fitr, Fitr, Fitr actually means, goes, it is in opposition to Saum. So Saum is fasting, Fitr, Iftar. So basically now we've completed the month of fasting and it's the Eid celebration with now eating. And this is, you know, this, uh, there's a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said uh, that for a fasting person, there are two reasons of happiness. Farhatun عِنْدَ لِقَاءِ رَبِّهِ وَفَرْحَةٌ عِنْدَ فِطْرِهِ Farhatun عِنْدَ فِطْرِهِ a fasting person has two means of happiness. One is 
the greater happiness, which is the happiness when you meet your Lord. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that. I mean, I mean, imagine that there's somebody in Ramadan who passes, passes away and they are fasting. And then Allah, the, the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa states that one of your happiness as a fasting person is a happiness in the fitrihi, like at the time of futur, iftar. And that's a small happiness. And the greater happiness is the happiness when you meet your Lord. So if somebody is fasting in Ramadan during the day and they are waiting for Maghrib Salah so that they will face and they, they, they will experience their happiness of futur. But if they've been righteous and pious, they go and meet their Allah and their Lord before the iftar arrives. They've basically achieved and experienced the greater happiness. The smaller happiness is for those people who are just left in the world. But their greater happiness was that they in the liqa Rabbi, they met their Lord. So this hadith, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, it's a famous hadith, for Lisaimi Farhatan. Fasting person has two means of happiness. One is Farhatun Inda Fitrihi wa Farhatun Inda Liqa Rabbi. The greater happiness is when you meet your Lord. But the other minor type of happiness is Farhatun Inda Fitrihi. Happiness at the time of Fitr. Fitr. Now here this muhaddithun and the commentators of the hadith and the great scholars of, of the past they've explained that this fitr here is not restricted to iftar every day both, both meanings have been given so one meaning is that at every day for the fasting person at the time of iftar there's this happiness farhatun inda fitrihi which means happiness at the time of iftar that at the time of iftar when you've been hungry all day and thirsty all day, and of course we are all happy right now. Alhamdulillah, we are fasting. We're happy with fasting as well. But like you know, in, when when the iftar time arrives, internally we're all happy. I'm sure. I mean, if you if you're not happy, then you're not human. Um, I, I am very happy. So when when the smell comes from the kitchen and you know it's like ten minutes left, and then you're, you're getting happy, happy, and then you sit down on near the food. And uh, you're waiting how many minutes left? No problem. This is also this is basically being human. And and when Allah says eat, eat, no problem. Eat your fill, but just avoid junk food. But eat, don't eat unhealthy food, but eat, and eat with desire. There's nothing wrong. Like some people say that well, you shouldn't eat. No, when Allah gives you the permissibility, and Allah says eat, now we eat with the way we were not eating with so much pleasure and desire. And remember, so fasting should be with pleasure and desire as well. Just like eating should be with thanks and gratitude and pleasure and desire, fasting should be with also pleasure and desire. Fasting shouldn't be with, with a frown on the face. I mean, of course, we get sometimes tired, sleepy, no problem. That's being normal. But, you know, complaining, oh, I can't take this hunger. And it's so thirsty and I'm so thirsty. And these fasts are so difficult. So fasting with a frown, like take, making it a chore, that's also wrong. So during the day, we should be happy to fast. But when iftar times arrive, arrives, then we should be happy to eat. Because at that time, Allah is saying eat. So we are happy to eat with full desire. And, you know, looking forward to eating and eat, no problem. And during the day when you're fasting, stay away from food. Also with happiness and wanting to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I was saying the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Farhatun in the fitrihi. One meaning is that there's a happiness at the time of iftar. When when the adhan of Maghrib, we hear it, Allahu Akbar, and you take that date or you take some water and that cold water, subhanAllah, like that water that you drink is probably the most tasty and pleasurable water you can ever drink. Like in normal days, you just go to the fridge and take some water, and like you won't even think. But the food that we eat at the time of iftar is much more enjoyable. So that's one meaning. However, many scholars of hadith have said that there's another meaning as well, which is farhatun in the fitri means the fasting person, his happiness is on fitr day. So not every day iftar, that's included. Maybe we can say that that's like the small, small happiness. So first day, second day, third day, fourth day, every day at the time of iftar, we are being slightly happy at the time of food, but then farhatun inda fitrihi means the happiness on the day of fitr, meaning Ramadan as a month as a whole was a fasting month.
because as a whole, even though at night you could eat, but as a whole, the month is wherein we stayed away from food and drink for most of the time, except at night, uh, we stayed away from sexual relations. We also, you know, like made a lot of sacrifice. Some people observed the itikaf, retreat, the spiritual retreat and seclusion, all of that. So now you've come out from there. There's a day of happiness. Happiness for what? Not happiness that, oh, great, it's over. Astaghfirullah. That's not the happiness. Just like iftar time, you're not happy when you're eating. Oh, great, the fast. That was such a big chore that I was fasting all day. I was so hungry. Thanks that I've got food now. And I'm so glad that fast's over. No, that's wrong. That's not the happiness. Happiness, like I was saying, during the day, alhamdulillah, I was fasting, but alhamdulillah, there's food now. So eat day, the happiness is not to be happy that I've got rid of Ramadan for one more year. A'udhu Billah, may Allah protect us. That's not the happiness. The happiness is, alhamdulillah, for one month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've completed a milestone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted me the ability to fast, to pray taraweeh, to offer qiyamul layl, to hajjud, tilaw of the Quran, like an achievement. So it's an internal type of happiness expressing thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a happiness, not happiness that the month is over. Rather, you, you, you're actually sad as well in a way. And a lot of people are. A lot of people think, oh, subhanAllah, Ramadan's over. You feel a bit sad that that whole uh, sort of atmosphere of Ramadan where you were fasting and you were worshipping Allah, it's over. So you do have a bit of sadness as well. But the happiness is for the achievement. Now here as well, there's another point to sort of understand internally. That to be happy on your achievement, is it sometimes some people might say that is that is that not wrong that you're happy like oh I gave in charity, alhamdulillah, I'm so happy I gave in charity, or I fasted, I'm so happy. You see, there's a difference. Being proud and arrogant over it, that's one thing. Being internally happy is something else totally altogether. And we've been commanded with the second type of happiness, not being proud, not boasting that, yes. Today, see, I fasted for 30 days. Do you know what? I completed like 10 uh, recitations of the Quran. Do you know I used to perform taraweeh, tahajjud every day? Like boasting and being proud over the achievement? That's wrong. That's wrong. But to be happy, and that's generally with all acts of ibadah. There's actually a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said that إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَتُكَ وَسَأَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكَ as far as I remember the, the words of the hadith, the last bit, I'm not exactly sure the wording in Arabic. If your sins make you sad and your good actions and your good deeds and your virtuous actions make you happy, then that's a sign that you're a believer. So being happy, like somebody gave, uh, you know, paid some money in charity, some, somebody recited the Quran and you're happy internally, that Alhamdulillah, all thanks to Allah, Allah gave me the ability to do this deed and you're happy, then that's good. That's a sign of being a Muslim that you're happy about things, good things that you're doing. And likewise, if somebody committed a sin and you feel bad, that you know what, I committed that sin, but you know, for a few days you feel bad about it, that's a sign that you're a believer. May Allah protect us from being such that when we commit sins, we don't even feel bad about them. That's what the hadith is saying. So Eid al-Fitr, to end this point, is basically a spiritual happiness. It's a day of expressing thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, expressing joy, thankfulness and joy and gratitude and happiness for what? For being able to worship Allah. That's why Eid is really not a physical or a cultural celebration. Eid is a spiritual celebration. It's for those people who've actually basically did some, they, those people who did something in Ramadan, they worshiped Allah, built a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is from taken from the Quran. Allah says, Surah Allah that you completed your days of fasting. And so that you glorify Allah. You say the takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallahu, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. I'll talk about that later on, inshallah. 
وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ And so that you show gratitude to your Lord. So this is a happiness, a spiritual happiness, that I am so happy, alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted me the ability to worship Him in Ramadan. So like I was saying, Eid al-Fitr is a day of being happy on one's own personal achievements. And uh, there's a hadith in Sunan al-Bayhaqi, Imam al-Bayhaqi relates this in his Shu'ab al-Iman and elsewhere, this hadith has been mentioned. Uh, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that فَإِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ عِيدِهِمْ يَعْنِي يَوْمَ فِطْرِهِمْ بَاهَا بِهِمْ مَلَائِكَتَهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Eid, when the day of Eid arrives, Eid al-Fitr arrives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala boasts before the angels. And Allah says to the angels, يَا مَلَائِكَتِي مَا جَزَاءُ أَجِيرٍ وَفَّى عَمَلَهُ O oh my angels! What is the reward of a slave or a servant who has completed his or her work or job? What's, what's the reward for someone who's put in the hours? So the angels, they say, Rabbana jaza'uhu an yuwaffa ajrah. The normal ruling, oh, my, oh our Lord, the reward is that they receive their full, full due and their full payment. If someone's put in the hours, someone put, put in the effort, the reward is that they should be given the full reward. So then Allah says to them, Ya Malaikati, O my angels. You know the reason why Allah boasts before the angels and tells the angels? Because he's talking about the humans. And these are the same angels that were complaining, not complaining, but they asked a question. When Allah was creating the human, the angels asked, we all know in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, they asked the question that, O oh, our Lord, are you about to create a creation that yasfikud dima? What's the verse? Yasfikud dima that they will shed blood. That the, the, these these are the humans that they will shed uh, shed blood and and they will murder and kill and they will do bad things. Allah says. Allah said to the angel, "A'lamu ma la ta'lamun." I know what you don't know. So. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the angels, like, look at my slaves. Then, so in this hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, after saying, asking the question to the angels, that, oh, our Lord, uh, after, sorry, saying to the angels that, what do you think of the reward of the person who puts in the effort? They said, oh, our Lord, he should be given full payment. So then Allah says, oh, my angels, abidi wa imai qadaw faridati alayhim, thumma kharaju ya'ujjuna ilayya bid-du'a. Oh, my angels, look at my slaves, my male slaves, my female slaves. Allah said male and female. Abidi wa imai. Male and female slaves. They completed their obligations in Ramadan. They fasted. They offered their prayers. And now, look at them. Thumma kharaju. Now they've left their homes and they've come out. These male and female slaves of mine. They completed their Ramadan and their Farida and their fasting and their uh, Tilawa and their Taraweeh and Qiyamul Layl. Now they've come out in the open field. Ya'ujuna ilayya bid dua. They've come out to pray to me and make dua from, to me. Wa izzati wa jalali wa karami wa uluwi wa rtifa'i makani. Allah is taking an oath. He says, by oath of my majesty and my lofty status and etc uh, etc et la ujibannahum i shall indeed without doubt accept their prayers and then allah says that he says to the slaves o oh slaves all of you all my servants and slaves that have come out on eid day for salat al eid irji'u return back to your homes now after you've completed your dua and your uh, salat and you, you've complete, completed your eight prayer. Irji'u, return. فَقَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ Indeed, I have forgiven you. And not just I've forgiven you. وَبَدَّلْتُ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ حَسَنَاتِ I've changed your sins and your deficiencies and your weaknesses. I've changed them and turned them into hasanat, into good actions and good deeds. This is basically that even in Ramadan, we were not able to fast like we were supposed to fast. We were not able to Pray like we were supposed to pray. You are not able to worship Allah as it is His right. 
yet, despite that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept it because we put in the effort. So Allah say, say, uh, says on Eid day that فَقَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ I've forgiven you and I've changed your deficiencies and your mistakes into hasanat, into good deeds. And فَيَرْجِعُونَ مَغْفُورًا لَهُمْ All of them will return home forgiven. So this is basically what Eid is about. It's about thankfulness to Allah and showing gratitude to Allah and being forgiven on Yawmul Eid, not being boastful, but this is why scholars say generally that look on Eid day, have this hope in Allah with, with your own self. Think that look, really the ibadah, the worship that I carried out, the fasting, the prayer, the, the taraweeh, the qiyamul Eid, all of this was not supposed to be like I was supposed to do them. I indeed have a lot of weaknesses and mistakes and errors and deficiencies, but I have hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah will accept and Allah has forgiven me. So eight day is like getting absolutely forgiven. So this is what Eid celebration is about. And this is why Eid Salah is really for a collective dua. It's a collective celebration. It's a collective means of forgiveness. It's a collective means of forgiveness. And this is why Generally, across board, it is recommended for Eid Salah that Eid Salah is supposed to be offered in an open plain, in a, like a big area. I mean, I know we are in lockdown situation and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But in normal situations, Eid prayer is supposed to be the less small, small congregations you have. This is the whole concept of Eid. The less small congregations you have, the better. Even in the masjid, masjid Ideally, there shouldn't be a Eid Salah. It should be in a massive place. Like each city should have a Musallah. This is why it's Sunnah is to go to the Musallah. Musallah technically is like on the outskirts. And this is why it's like everybody should walk to the Musallah. Say the Takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Wallahi alhamd. And come back from another route. Why? Because we want diff different people to see us, that these are Muslims. They've completed something. They're happy that they've achieved something great in their lives. You know, they're happy that they've fasted and they've offered taraweeh. So everybody is walking. Everybody is en route to this big open space on the outskirts of the city. The real sunnah of Eid is like on the outskirts of the city. But if that is not possible, then inside the city, a big place where the whole city, everybody from the city, they all gather in one place. This is basically all of the Muslims have come out to Allah to pray to him, to show their gratitude, to express their thankfulness and their gratitude and asking Allah, the hadith said, bidua. They are begging and crying to Allah and asking Allah to forgive them. And from there, when they return, they all return as forgiven. So this is the whole concept. And this is why in a one open space, However, if that's not even possible, and like now in many countries and in the UK, we have Eid Salah in Masajid as well. That's permissible. It's not like it's not permissible, but it's actually recommended that the, le the less mosques actually hold the Eid Salah, the better. So if you have like just three, four in the city, really, really big ones, and then the big open space. This mosques is because not everybody can go to the open space. Sometimes some people are old and elderly, etc. Someone's just living close to the masjid, can't go to the open space, etc. So there should be a better facility available for people in the major mosques. But the whole idea behind Eid Salah is that it's something that's done. It's a communal prayer. Just like Jumu'ah. Jumu'ah is from the word Jama'ah. And Jama'ah basically means gathering. It's a, it's a gathering. It's where people gather. It's not something, it's not like every small, small corner there's a Jumu'ah taking place. And that's why I recommend that outside of this lockdown situation, that try to go to the main congregations. Like even if you're working, etc. Sometimes not possible, not possible. But if it's possible and you can, then inshallah, like go to the masjid and major, big, big places and not have like three, four people, uh, four people in having a Jumu'ah Salah there and five, four people at work there and upstairs and they're having theirs at 2 p.m. and then downstairs, you know, the, the, the office people here having it at 3 p.m. and then some five people having it there because the whole spirit of Jumu'ah is not really there in that case. Jumu'ah will be valid, but um, the spirit is not there. So the same spirit is with Eid Salah as well. And this is why Eid Salah is really a communal, it's a collective prayer. It's a prayer where everybody is together. And it's not something that we have small, small places. 
Uh, that's why in normal situations, it's definitely not right. If we were outside this lockdown situation, it would definitely not be right. Like if next year, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed this uh, wada and this illness and this virus from us and from everyone else, from all the countries, Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. But if we, for example, Eid al-Adha, I don't know how the situation would be in Eid al-Adha, but like let's say Eid al-Fitr next year, then, you know, don't even think about like, okay, me and my family, we're just going to have a, like a uh, Eid Salah in the garden. Like I'm going to talk about this later about the ruling now, but I'm saying in normal situations, next year, you might just think that, you know what, like going to the mosque, the masjid, or going to the big open space, like so much traffic, and like the time is not suitable, you just say to your friends and your two, three families, we're going to have a barbecue anyway in my garden, I've got a mansion, I'm not saying I've got a mansion, I'm saying someone say, they've got a mansion, and like I can get 20 people, we're all coming, barbecue starts at 10, so you know what, Tell your uncle, auntie, sister, cousin, sister, cousin, brother, like all of you, just inshallah, just get here for nine o'clock, 9.30, and in the garden, like we'll all pray our salah. We've got a, someone who knows a bit of Arabic and have them, you know, half of an imam, or just, you know, call an imam as well. And like, start the barbecue anyway, and then we'll pray the Eid Salah. And whilst you're praying the barbecue, you know, some people are still doing the Ar barbecue, and then they join in Eid Salah, and then have the barbecue there. That is definitely wrong. It's like not the spirit of Eid at all whatsoever and may not even be valid uh, in normal situations. So therefore, this is something that really we need to think that, you know, right now we're going through a lockdown situation, but this should never encourage anyone, whichever ruling they're following right now, should never encourage anyone in normal situation to ever go away from the main communal prayer, because that is the spirit and that is the ruling, and that is very, very, very important. So this is basically the, the concept of Eid and the Salah of Eid, etc. Now, right now, we are, of course, experiencing a, a very unprecedented, uh, unprecedented and difficult kind of situation. So what do we do for Eid Salah, etc.? Some places, there's lockdown, like very strict lockdown from the government. Some places, lockdown has been eased. So some rules are in place, some rules are not in place. So each country, the, the situation, on the ground will of course be different. Before I come to the Eid day, we should not forget that Eid the night is also very, very important for a believer. Eid the night is also very important for a believer. In uh, some narrations, Eid the night is known as Laylatul Ja'iza, the night preceding the day. Remember in Islam, the night comes before the day. So if you have Friday, then the night of Friday arrives first and then the day arrives. So. Laylatul Eid, Laylatul Eid, or Laylatul Eid al-Fitr, the night of Eid al-Fitr, known as Laylatul Ja'iza, a night to worship Allah, again receive rewards from Him. It's reported that the Messenger وسلم, would not sleep in the night preceding Eid al-Fitr. We can sleep, but remember, he, he wasn't thinking that, you know what, I have to wake up and then like start all my celebration, because it was more, of, more like a spiritual celebration. All night, he would spend the night of reward, the Laylatul Ja'iza, in worshipping Allah. It's a night where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows his rewards on those people who have spent the month of Ramadan fasting and offering Tarawih and Qiyamul Layl, etc. And their prayers are accepted in this night. There's a hadith in Sunan ibn Majah where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Man qama laylatay al-eidayn muhtasiban lam yamut qalbuhu yawma tamut al-qulub. Whoever stands up in worship in the two in the two nights prece preceding the two Eids, in the two nights preceding the two Eids, expecting rewards from his or her Lord, this person's heart will not die when the other hearts will die. So we should really benefit from this opportunity. We are in lockdown anyway, so don't let the Eid night go to waste. Uh, we should try to perform as much worship in this night as we can and pray for our needs and pray really make dua for like we've been doing in Ramadan because read the night a lot of times what happens in normal situations when Maghrib arrives and it's your last day of fast that's it people think okay now time's over I'm going for my haircut and everybody's like you know going for haircuts and all of this and it's like you know the whole spiritual aspect has gone no read the night is a very 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 important night it's like Laylatul Qadr night you know, it's a very, very important night. So, therefore, read the night, really try to spend at least 
some time, one hour, two hours in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, half an hour, whatever you can, inshaAllah ta'ala. And then each day, we have to also remember that there's something called Sadaqatul Fitr or Zakatul Fitr. Zakatul Fitr is the Zakat, it, it is known as Zakat al Fitr. So we have the normal Zakat and we have the Zakat al Fitr. Normal Zakat, the regular yearly Zakat, that is called Zakatul Mal. That's the Zakat of the wealth. It's not called the annual zakat because you might not have to pay it annually. Like this year, I might have the money, so I have to pay. But next year, I might not be rich. I might not have the required money. So it's no longer an obligation for me. So that zakat is connected to the wealth. It depends on how much wealth you have. And that's why that is termed as zakatul mal, the charity, the zakat, which means a purification charity of your wealth. This zakat on Eid al-Fitr is known as zakatul fitr. Some people call it Sadaqatul Fitr. You can't say Sadaqatul Fitr. The other one as well, you can call it Zakat, uh, Sadaqatul Mal. Sadaqa, Zakat, both have the same kind of meaning. So the normal wealth one, you can call it Zakatul Mal or Sadaqatul Mal. And this one is known as Zakatul Fitr or Sadaqatul Fitr. So let's just use the word Zakat. So Zakatul Fitr is an obligation. An obligation on every Muslim, male or female, who owns a certain amount of money, 615.36 uh, grams of silver, uh, whoever owns that in any format, like whether it's cash or the equivalent of that, whoever uh, owns in cash or goods or beyond your basic needs, anything you have extra, you take the value of that. And 635, uh, 635.36 grams of silver, it's like a few hundred pounds, like whatever, this, that's a zakat nisab as well, about five, 600 pounds. So if you have about that much, then it's an obligation on you. And you have to pay this before you perform your Eid. Like it's really, the point, the, the, the concept behind it is that this is, we pay this so that we remember the poor and the orphans and the needy and the not so privileged also on Eid Day. So because we are celebrating on Eid Day, we are inshallah, uh, along with the spiritual celebration, we will also be happy and we'll be having a good meal and we'll be having that barbecue I was talking about in the garden, etc. Uh, so what about the poor people? So let's think about them as well. So this money should reach, ideally the idea is that this money should reach them before Eid. So we should try to pay this a few days in advance, to be honest, because we don't know like, if you're giving it directly to the poor, then yes, no problem. You say, okay, you know what? I'm going to eat salah on my way. I'm going to to the door of the poor and knock on his door and say, here's your sadaqat, here's the money for you, like a gift. No problem. But a lot of times people just go into the masjid in the mosque and they just give it out the door and it stays in that box. And then when they just, the mosque just keeps that money along with the other zakat wealth. And maybe in three months, four months, five months, six months down the line, they'll probably give it to somebody poor. It's valid. But the spirit is not achieved. And that's why it's, it's, it's important that you pay it in advance so that the money reaches the poor by the day of Eid. So anyone who has that amount of money, they need to give a certain amount, which is equivalent to 1.75 kilograms of wheat for its value. You can give the wheat if you want or the dates or whatever, different things. But normally, like in the UK, many scholars have uh, calculated this year, they say three pounds. Some have said 350, just consult your local uh, scholar, imam, masjid, and have whatever calculation they've done, inshallah, not a problem. If you want to give more, give more. You don't have to, but if you want to give, like, what's three pounds, three pounds, fifty, if you think, like, ten pounds, ten pounds is good. But try to get this to the poor before Eid day. So that's something really, really important on Eid day. Now, with Eid salah, in normal situations, Eid salah is, of course, an obligation. Eid salah, in normal situations, is, of course, it's an obligation Wajib, according to some schools of thought, like the Hanafi school, it's wajib. According to some others, like the Shafi school, it's sunnah mu'akkada, like highly emphasized sunnah. And uh, according to some others, like Imam Ahmed al Hamal, it's fard kifaya. Fard kifaya means like a collective fard, like janazah prayer. So if some people offer Eid in the main musalla or in the main mosque, I mean, there's various narrations in the Hanbali Madhab, but this is one of the common ones, is Fard Kifaya. So which means if some people offer it, then the obligation is uplifted from everybody. So like if the congregation is taking place outside, I don't have to pray, like I'm not sinful. 
uh, the Shafi'i say it's an emphasized sunnah and the Hanafi say it's necessary, it's wajib. And this is like if you're not traveling, etc., then it's not um, uh, necessary on you. You see, the, I know this sometimes is very difficult to understand this, but the, the ruling of Eid Salah holds a less of a, like a importance than the five time prayers. This is why on Eid day, I, I forgot to mention the night and then in the morning, Sadaqat al Fitr, but make sure Fajr Salah. Fajr Salah is really important. It's actually far more important that we offer our Fajr prayers because Fajr is Fard. It's not Fard Kifaya or Wajib or Sunnah Muakkada. It's like an absolute obligation, like really, really important. At least in Ramadan and at least on Eid day, try to pray Fajr on time. Uh, and then inshallah, try to continue like the next day and the, all our lives inshallah. Even a traveling person has to offer Fajr, like Dhuhr and Asad and Maghrib Isha. Even if you're traveling, whilst you're traveling, Prayers are not forgiven. Yes, you can shorten them, qasr, but they're not forgiven. Whereas Eid Salah, according to many schools of thought, a musafir or someone who's traveling, Eid Salah is forgiven. So we need to also remember this, the importance of other prayers. Like we don't, we don't, we don't just, on Eid day, whether it's lockdown situation or no, no lockdown situation, just, okay, just pray Eid Salah and that's it. And forget the Fajr and Dhuhr, Asal, Maghrib, Isha, then that's really defeating the objective and the purpose that the reason Allah Allah wanted us to come and offer so that he forgives us and celebrating it's like we're going to celebrate on Eid day on Eid Salah in the open space because we've in Ramadan we fasted and we've prayed all our prayers and Taraweeh and Qiyamul Layl and Tilawa and worshipped Allah last night and this morning we prayed Fajr and now we're there Allah give us now you know give us the reward so you know asking Allah for reward on Eid day when we haven't offered Fajr, it kind of like doesn't seem right with, with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but still, inshallah, you can still go. So Fajr Salah is important. And then after that, with, the, with this Eid situation, people have been asking that what do we do in the lockdown situation? Shall we offer Eid or not offer Eid Salah, etc.? Now, there's a very lengthy discussion on this. Scholars have been debating, discussing this. For, for the past weeks, couple of weeks, and looking at different issues and different angles and different, you know, and this is something which scholars always do and it is required. I mean, the people who are experts, they have to look at the fiqh and hadith and the Quran and try to come up with what they think is the Islamic ruling. So, there's one view, which is that people can offer salah at home, read prayer. According to like the Shafi'i school, even a person who's an individual, by him or herself, can offer Eid Salah. So there's no khutbah, you just perform your Eid Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you know, the, the extra takbirah. You make an intention for Eid Salah and you perform Eid Salah at home. You're just living alone by yourself and you just pray. According to some others, they say no, a congregation is required. Some might say only two is enough. Some might, some opinions are that like you have to have four people. And there is another opinion, which is the opinion that I follow, uh, which is that Eid Salah should not be performed in this current situation, in the lockdown situation. Number one, it's not necessary. I think most people will say that it's not necessary. I don't think anyone says you have to. So that is, alhamdulillah, you know, for some people who don't want to pray Eid Salah, they'll have to pray Fajr, of course. Make sure you pray Fajr. But then after that, maybe after Fajr, you can go to sleep for a few hours and then, you know, wake up for your barbecue at 12 o'clock. If you want to do that, no problem. Like, you don't have to pray. Um, that's agreed upon. But the view I follow with regards to Eid Salah itself praying is that individual houses where you have four, four people, five people, small, small, small congregations. Number one, it goes against the spirit. Like I was saying in normal situations, like, like next year, for example, you know, there's no examples of having many, many small, small congregations. That's not really what the objective is for Eid Salah. It's a communal prayer. Yes, right now we can't go to the main prayer. We are in lockdown situation. Then there are other technical issues like, you know, because this is the Hanafi view. And also in the Hanafi school, there are some scholars who've said that it's fine because they've looked at it from another angle. And there are many other scholars and, and uh, the view that I follow, we've looked at it from another angle that uh, because there's no general permission given and there's no public access for everyone, you know, it's not like your house is open that anyone in your whole city, whoever wants to 
come and pray salah, uh, which is a condition, what we call Ibn al-Am. I've written a whole detailed article. Maybe somebody can put a link and you can read all of that. I don't need to go into that right now. But this is an approach that I've taken and I've said that it's better. We shouldn't be praying Eid salah at home. Now, it's a, you know, it's a small issue. It's not really a big deal. I mean, different madhabs allow it. Other opinions allow it. From a fiqh point of view, it's not a big deal. It's only basically the, the view that I follow is that you don't pray Eid salah, but what do you do? You perform nafil prayer instead. So basically, remember, it's all about Allah accepting. You know, Eid Salah or no Eid Salah, it's really about thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if someone follows this opinion that, look, I won't pray Eid Salah, I will not offer Eid Salah, but I will perform what we call nafil or Salatul Duha. Basically, and I've written another article on that as well today, about how to offer this nafil prayer. So according to the Hanafi school, they say, based on the statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, who used to say that whoever is not able to perform salah or misses the salah or unable to perform it in the main mosque or the main musallah, then فَلْيُسَلِّي أَرْبَعْ rak'at. He should perform four rak'ah. These four rak'ah are basically salat al-duha. Intention is mid-morning prayer, forenoon prayer, mid-morning prayer. Uh, try to pray it. It, you can offer this anytime after sunrise, but like not exactly straight after sunrise, but when the sun has gone like 10, 15 minutes after sunrise above the horizon and try to make sure that you pray after at least one of the mosques because your main mosques will maybe have a small Eid prayer, like four people, five people not breaking the law. So after they've completed their prayer, then you offer your nafil and you offer this nafil at home for rak'ah. You can perform two, you can perform four, you can do six, you can do eight, you can go all the way to 12 and you can do like 200 if you want to. But Recommended is four. Number one, because Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said four, so we should try to do four. And also, because the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his habit was with, with Salat al-Duha was normally four rak'ah. So four rak'ah, and then the Hanafi school states that without two salams, like you pray all four together. So all four together with one taslim, you sit down for the first tashahud and then you stand up uh, and you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, four rak'ah. The recitation will be silent, not audible. So you don't read loudly. Uh, you recite silently. And lastly, about congregation is that normally in non-fard prayers and the ones where there's clear mention of congregation like Jumu'ah and Eid uh, and the five fard prayers, according to the Hanif school, it is just like to have a congregation. However, this is when you invite people and you, make, you announce it and you invite people and have a large gathering. So some of the Hanafi early scholars said that if you've got about four people and you haven't invited others, it's okay. What we call tada'i. But if you've got five people and you're inviting, then that's makruh. So if you have a congregation at home as a family, like there's two of you, three of you, four of you, four of you, definitely fine at home as a congregation. Four rak'ah, you know, you pray together, recite silently. If it's five or six, your family, you have, mashallah, a lot of people in your family. I personally feel, inshallah, it should be okay because you're still not inviting people from outside your family. It's not like a tada'i. You're not inviting people. So if you want to be on the safe side, just stick to four. Like if you've got eight people in your family, then you say to those four, you go in the bedroom and you do your jama'ah there and we'll be downstairs in the living room. As for, we'll do our jama'ah here. Alhamdulillah, that's a great way. Remember, ultimately, it's about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not really about what we're doing. You know, these things are not the objective. The objective is what we think. What does Allah want from us? And I've mentioned this previously many times before as well, that I know sometimes we feel this attachment with some of these symbols of Islam and we should feel attachment. But remember, deen is not really about doing what we feel like doing, like especially this ruling when I've said many times to people that this is the view I follow. And of course, respect that opinion as well. And other views, no problem whatsoever. But like the view that, okay, you shouldn't offer eight salah. So a lot of people are feeling this, like how can I like, have a Eid without Eid Salah. It will not be an Eid. But if that's a ruling, then it's like, you know, that's what is required. If, if you are following the ruling, like some people ask me that which ruling I follow, should I follow? I say, look, follow the ruling of those scholars or those madhabs that you've always followed and you have more trust in and you feel more inclined towards academically, not sentimentally, not what you feel like doing. So like, because this view is saying you should pray Eid Salah and I want to pray Deen is not about fulfillment. It's not about fulfilling what we want to do. But yeah, if you are following like a particular view and some scholars and you trust them and they are saying that you should pray Eid Salah, then alhamdulillah, you go and pray Eid Salah. But if someone, like for example, today or yesterday, somebody asked me that I follow the Hanafi school. 
Now, within even the Hanafi school, there are opinions of some that you can pray Eid Salah. But he said, look, I follow the Hanafi school and I follow your opinion and I follow the opinion of those scholars who are saying that you should not offer Eid Salah. But this one time in my life that said, I'm going to leave you. Uh, this is the only time I'm going to pray my Eid Salah. Is that wrong? I said, well, I mean, you're asking me now again. You don't want to follow the opinion. And now why are you asking me is wrong? Because if you're always following a certain scholar or certain scholars, then you even though you don't feel like doing what they're saying, this is what submission means. That you just follow that. Uh, but he said, look, I'm taking the Shafi'i opinion this time. This time I'm going to take the Shafi'i opinion and I'm offering eight salah at home. So I said, okay. But then I said, make sure this is just a part, you know, a passing com comment. I said, make sure learn the way of offering eight salah according to the Shafi'i Madhab as well. Because if you're, you know, lots of people are saying we're taking the Shafi'i opinion and I'm praying by myself at home. But the Shafi'i way is five takbir and seven takbirat and extra takbirat. So also keep that in mind. You don't just pick and choose from here and there. But anyway, that's another whole issue altogether. So it's not a big issue. Uh, now, some people have asked about whether can we pray in our lawns and in our parks. And I wouldn't recommend it, to be honest. And first of all, the recommendation depends on the law of your country. If there's strict lockdown, then breaking the law and you know putting yourself in danger and putting other people in danger. I wouldn't advise it, and I would say that you shouldn't do that, really. Just stay at home. Like, if, you, if you're if you following an opinion to pray Eid Salah, just pray Eid Salah at home. And if you're following an opinion that you shouldn't pray, then inshallah, like, Allah will still give you the reward. You will still get your reward, inshallah, and thanksgiving will still take place with Allah knows, Allah knows that you are in lockdown situation. So you don't have to really worry about it. You don't have to be sad. Like, you know, certain sisters in Ramadan, they were not able to fast because they experienced menstrual period. Now, there were sisters, and every year, sisters feel so sad about this. And that's a good thing that you're sad. No problem. Like sisters, they experience hate, but they can't fast. And they say, oh, no, Ramadan time. I really want to fast, but I can't fast. I can't pray. Internally, if they feel sad. That is actually an amazing sign that you want to do good. But they're not going to start fasting because they feel sad, because they know that despite me wanting to fast, what my Lord wants from me is not to fast. So they don't fast. They feel sad about it. So Allah knows. Allah will give them the same reward, inshallah, for fasting. For not fasting. Because Allah is the one who's told them, and through his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that do not fast whilst you're on your menstrual period. So all these things, like, you know, even on Eid day, people want to meet and hug one another. Now, greeting a Muslim hugging them, etc., is a great act of reward. You know, just hugging anyone at any time is a great act of reward. Showing happiness and giving gifts to one another. But if we are not doing that because of social distancing rulings, and we make the intention, make this intention that I am protecting myself and protecting other people and saving the lives of everybody, inshallah, we will be rewarded for not hugging because we've made another intention. So sometimes hugging becomes an act of ibadah, a reward, and sometimes not hugging becomes something as an act of ibadah. Just like fasting, on Eid day we can't fast. Imagine you guys feel so spiritual and say, look, you know what, on Eid day I want to fast as well. But fasting on Eid day, not fasting is an ibadah. So therefore, uh, we have to remember that on Eid day as well, if you're not praying, we feel sad. But don't worry, inshallah, Allah will still give the reward. So this whole park loan thing, um, I wouldn't recommend it. Number one, it depends on what your laws are. So if the law is saying that you shouldn't be going to each other's houses, etc., just look at what the law is saying and what the medical advice is and etc. and base it on that. From a Sharia point of view, will your salah be valid or not? Uh, like as the, the, the view I follow, which is of the Hanafi Madhab and the Idna Am issue and the general permission issue. There's two things here. One is the public access general permission issue and the other is the greater concept. So from a greater concept perspective, still, like even if you have in your garden five people, in their garden five people, it's not about gardens because it's still like small, small, small. And it can set the precedence of people doing, like I said, next year we'll have so many garden eight prayers. So from a like a greater picture point of view, it's still not encouraged. But technically, is it valid or not? Then it is based on whether there's public access or not. If you've gone to a place in your lawn, in your garden, and you've opened it up for anyone in your community, like everyone, it doesn't matter how many people come. It doesn't matter if there's six or five. 
But the point is that if you have said it's open, whoever wants to come and pray here, they can pray, then technically the salah will be valid. And if that's not the case, there's no entrance, the doors, the entry is not, it's not accessible for everybody else, then technically salah will not be valid. And that's the view that I follow. But inshallah, like I said, there are multiple views and you can follow the views of those scholars and those madhabs that you trust the most. And inshallah, we take, you know, based uh, your practice of eight day based on that. And finally, I'm completely coming to an end. Also on eight day, don't forget the sunnah. Like if it's a lockdown Eid, it doesn't mean we don't act upon the various other sunnahs. So like taking a bath in the morning, start the day with eating something, dates or something sweet. That's also like a way of expressing happiness because you know, every day in the morning we used to never eat anything. So now Allah has said, today is the day of eating. So we eat, we start the day with eating. Have something, apply perfume, wear your best clothes. Doesn't necessarily have to be new clothes but your best clothes uh, and recite the takbir as much as possible. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. Inside your house, without disturbing people, of course, very important. Don't start screaming and shouting and disturbing people, but as much as you can. And even outside, you know, you can go for like, they say one exercise a day, well now we can go multiple times for exercise. So just go with your family, like outside in the garden and in, in, into the park, go for a walk, three, four of you uh, as a family together and read Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Great, great uh, rewards in there as well. And a great way of acting upon so that you glorify your Lord. So start the day like this. I mean, I would recommend the way to start your day would be at night first, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wake up early in the morning, maybe the whole family of a Fajr Salah in congregation. There's no two opinions about that, that you can pray Fajr at home. There's no two opinions that you can pray in congregation. There's no two opinions that you can read audibly. So those two rakat of Fajr, it's exactly like Eid Salah. The only thing is you're not doing extra Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It's two rakah, it's longer as well. It's a beautiful prayer. Fajr prayer, subhanAllah, it's such a beautiful, one of the most pleasurable prayers. As the people, I mean, I feel that from the five prayers, the most pleasurable because it's not night and it's not day. It's like you know, just early in the morning. Most people are still asleep. You can hear the birds. That's why you know it's a time of reflection. Adhkar sabah. You you after salah you make adhkar and dhikr and make all the duas and all of this. It's a, it's an amazing time. In the Quran al Fajr kana It's a it's a very calm and peaceful time. So this time, Subhanallah, on Eid day, all of you together as a family, offer like your Fajr with a lot of khushu and a lot of khudu. Make it like the Eid Fajr. Like put so much into it. This is our Special Eid Fajr at home collectively. There's no two opinions. You can pray that, and inshallah, you will really enjoy it. And then after that, when the sun, then maybe after you've completed that, then maybe like have something to eat. Maybe have a breakfast, have some dates, some sweets, some nice things, savories, whatever. Stay healthy, but eat something nice uh, collectively as a family. Eat something, and then when the sun has risen, and 10 15 minutes after that, if you're following the opinion that there's no Eid Salah. Then inshallah, four rak'at, salat al-duha, together or alone, and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then start your barbecue after that, or whatever, in the garden, or whatever meal you're having. And if you're following the rule that you pray Eid Salah, then pray your Eid Salah. Uh, and then spend the rest of the day, try to be happy and be joyful and express happiness, and inshallah, um, try to call people that you can't meet. Uh, inshallah, make personal phone calls, rather than, you know, these random, just text messages, tailor-made, that you've, what do you call them? The, Forward forwarded or no there's just already made Template. templates yeah you know rather than template it's not haram but I'm, i just feel that template read messages just you know message people and write their name down assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh brother huzaifa for example assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh sister aisha or fatima or whatever and you know it's more personal the message or maybe call them give them a phone call and inshallah uh, there will be a lot of reward in that as well, insha'Allah ta'ala. I don't think I've missed anything. Um, so yeah, I think with that, insha'Allah, we end with this and we can take some questions now, insha'Allah ta'ala. Also, one more thing, finally, shawwal. 
there's actually a recommendation of fasting in Shawwal, which is the month after Ramadan. Uh, there's a hadith with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, uh, whoever fasts the six days of Shawwal, uh, it's like as though he fasted the entire year. So try to fast in Shawwal as well, inshallah. Ta'ala. It's, it's a great sunnah. I've got a whole article on that as well. Man sama Ramadana, thumma atba'ahu bisittin min Shawwal, kana ka siyam al-dahr in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Whoever completes the fast of Ramadan and then follows it up with six fasts of Shawwal, it doesn't have to be consecutively over the whole month of Shawwal, six. It is as though the person has fasted the whole year. I have an article on that as well. We can give that link to as well, inshallah. I've already asked, answered this. Someone said, are we allowed to pray Eid Salah at home according to Hanafi Fiqh? So like I said, that the view that I follow and many of my teachers, and one of them is Sheikh Mufti Taqbal Uthmani, Habibullah, and some other scholars as well that I know, Hold the view that you shouldn't pray in salah, rather you pray nafil. But like I said, it's not a big issue. Like there's no difference. The difference is like the intention and whether you're going to do your hands. If you're praying fajr or nafil after that, if you're praying nafil for rakah, you'll be praying for two extra rakah. And you know, just think that inshallah, this is like an eight salah. But other people have an opinion that you can, so you can inshallah, according to their opinion. If you follow their opinion, difference of praying at home. We have to have discussed it. Shall we encourage people to pray in Eid in parks? I don't personally say we should encourage, no. See, the issue is that why do we have to go out of our way if, not, if we're not going to be sinful? So Allah will give the same reward. We don't know. How do you know that if you pray at home, Nafil, your ikhlas and your sadness will be so much that Allah will give you this much reward more than you praying Eid Salah in the park or whatever? Because you're so sad and you're feeling that, look, this year because of this lockdown, I have to pray nafil and I'm so sad about it. Ultimately, it's about the reward, isn't it? It's not about like I, what I've done. So it's, who knows? There could be more reward in that nafil over eat some. So we don't really need to, if it's not necessary, then why go to the parks? I personally say that, look, if it's causing problems and giving uh, non-Muslims to point fingers I mean, if it's okay by law, then fine, go. But if it's not really okay by the law of your country, then either follow this opinion that you just pray nafil at home or follow that opinion, pray Eid at home. But this one, like, you know, trying to go outside and try to be in the middle somewhere. Uh, personally, I don't feel that's right because unless if it's okay by law, then fine. Uh, I don't know if there's anything here. I know it's coming there, but why was this not good? Okay, that one's finished. Uh, in a normal situation, would it be better to pray Eid Salah in a park in a masjid? I think I covered this. Definitely better in the park. Uh, the best is to have a proper musalla, like, which is a waqf place on the outskirts of the city. If that's not possible, then a park open space and then in the masjid. So definitely praying in an open space in a park where there's lots of people, like a communal prayer, that is definitely uh, better. What should we do on Eid the night? Like I said, just whatever you can, nothing specific. Some tahajjud, some crying, begging to Allah, some dua, some dhikr, some contemplation, lots of dua with concentration. It's about how you do it, not what you do, inshallah. Would it be haram to meet family against government instructions? I don't want to give a fatwa saying it's haram, but normally, yes, the ruling is that if you break the law of the country, then that is wrong and it's not permissible. I don't like to use the word haram, it's a very strong word, but I would say it's not permissible to break the law of the country, just like any other law of the country, uh, any country that you live in. So it would not be permissible. And then if it's also like, for example, parking cars, you know, people ask that, like, I park cars on double yellow lines, like, where I'm not supposed to park cars. It's not permissible because that's a law. And then also, if it's harming people, like, you've parked in a way, like, in the corner where it's harming people, then definitely it's wrong because now the aspect of not just going against government law, but again, also the aspect of harming others. So if it's going to cause harm to people because there's a chance of the virus being transmitted to others, then definitely it'll be wrong. 
Someone said, what, what, why we shouldn't pray at home during lockdown rather than at, uh, why we shouldn't pray at home during lockdown rather than at home. The, the reason why we shouldn't pray at home rather than at home. Besides Idnul Am, what's the reason? I mean, I'm not understanding the question, but maybe what, what you're trying to say that what is the reason? I've, like I said, I've got a whole article on that. I've explained it. The, uh, there's One is the main reason, like the concept behind it, which is the issue that there's no precedence in our history of having, you know, people praying Eid Salah at home, like small, small Salahs. Uh, so that's one issue. And the other reason is the Ibn al issue, which is a Hanafi Madhab issue that it, if, if there's no public access and general permission given to others, then technically Salah is not supposed to be performed. So that's another reason. Best time for Salat al-Duha. Well, before that, when does uh, Takbir of Eid start and end? It can start any time after Maghrib, the night before. So you can start saying it then, whenever, as much as possible, the night, during the day. Um, so, inshallah, that's fine. And best time for Salat al-Duha is mentioned by all the imams from the various madhabs based on hadith is that when when it's halfway point between sunrise and when the the ending time so when the sun the time starts when the sun rises 10 15 minutes after that and when the sun is on zenith like istiwa like right in the center so beginning of dhuhr time so halfway between sunrise and beginning of dhuhr time that would be the best time inshallah but it's permissible even before that and it's permissible later as well inshallah Okay, I think uh, someone's asked, what's the difference between Duha and Ishraq? I've actually got a whole answer on that as well, on this topic, on my website, daruliftar.com. I, I don't know if we can, someone know, if you, someone can just search it and just put the link there. Because this is an old issue. People say, is it the same? Is it different prayers? And I've actually explained it that really it's the same prayer. Ishraq and Duha is really, it's like minor Duha is Ishraq and major Duha is Duha. So, if someone wants to do two prayers, they do two, but in the hadith, there's only one prayer mentioned. Sometimes it's mentioned after sunrise, 10 15 minutes after it, and sometimes later. So, I've got a whole detailed article on this topic whether they are the same things or different prayers. Praying nafil in jama'ah, is it okay to do so? And if so, can we do out loud? I just explained that in the, art, in the lecture, I, I mentioned this. And I've got it in the article as well, but I mentioned that we should pray silently. Actually, it is makruh according to the Hanafi school, and most others don't allow it. Uh, most others say it's wrong, they don't say makruh, but all you see the principle in according to all the four madhabs and across the board is that nafil or sunnah at night has to uh, a person has a choice, but better to read loudly based on the night prayers. So when it's dark, you have Fajr, you read loudly. Maghrib, you read loudly. Isha, you read loudly as an Imam. So therefore, the Nafil and the prayers will follow that ruling. Whereas the day prayers, Dhuhr and Asr, you pray silently as an Imam. So therefore, daytime, you're supposed to pray silently. So the, all the Madhabs agree that if you're not praying Farad and you're praying Nafil or Ishraq or Duha or whatever, you should pray silently during the day. And if you're praying nafil at night, then you have a choice, but it's better to pray loudly. So this is agreed according to all the madhabs. And the Hanafi madhab go one step extra. They say it's actually wajib in the nawafil of nahar. It is wajib and necessary during the nafil of the day to pray silently. And it's makruh to pray loudly. So therefore in Salat al-Duha, it will be makruh to pray loudly. You have to pray silently, inshallah. But with congregation, I've mentioned it. I look, if it's a small family congregation without calling and inviting others, uh, then it's okay. Uh, going, according to the interpretation of Idhn al-Am, taken by other Hanafi scholars, would Eid and Jum'ah Salah be allowed in homes post-lockdown -lock -lock without dislike? Yeah, you need to ask them that question. <laughs> so, because I don't follow that, so that, that would be a valid question. So th those scholars, I'm not encouraging it. So uh, if... There are scholars who say that Salah is valid, you know, they have a different explanation, understanding of Ibn Al-Am. Then I would think they would say, yeah, Eid and Jumu'ah, even post lockdown would be allowed as well. Um, and even Eid, so next year, technically, Eid would be allowed at home as well and in your garden as well, it will be allowed, I think. But it's best to ask them. 
Isn't there a narration that Ibn Abbas prayed Eid with his family at home? Not Ibn Abbas. Number one, you've got that wrong. It's not Ibn Abbas. It's Anas ibn Malik. There's one narration. But this is all discussed. It's not just one. I actually just read uh, some scholars from Mauritius. They put a whole, like a whole 10 page book together where they analyzed not just this one, but few other you know, practices of certain tabi'in and, and then analyzed it from a, like a authenticity point of view. And so this is all a discussion like for the scholars, people of hadith and fiqh and you know, debating and discussing. And that opposes what Anas bin Malik and who said, and he said that you should pray, uh, sorry, not Anas, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he says, whoever misses, then don't pray at home, Eid, rather offer uh, nafil. So now you have this, Statement of Abdullah bin Mas'ud versus a practice of Anas, which one are you going to prefer? So this is what the mothers always do, like all issues, whether blood comes out or doesn't come out, does it break your wudu if it comes out or not? One madhab is looking at all these evidences on one side, the other madhab is looking at these, they prefer these evidences and they have an explanation for the other types of evidences. And these people who follow these evidences, they'll explain away the other. And this is our whole fiqh is based on that. And this is what we have all these thousands of books about. So that's a scholarly issue. You don't just say someone just took this one hadith and this is what happened. Uh, what is the ruling with regards to doing musafaha and Eid? I understand during lockdown this isn't possible, but, but how about out of it? Okay, someone's asking in normal situations, Musafaha. Musafaha is not really a sunnah of Eid. Rather, it's not really a sunnah anyway. The most you can say it's mustahab. It's a good thing, uh, but it's not restricted to Eid. So if someone thinks that, oh, it's a special kind of act of Eid, then it's wrong. It could even be bid'ah. But someone doesn't think that, and they just say, oh, yeah, assalamu alaikum, I haven't met you for a long time, and you met him on Eid day because you met him last Eid, and you're not doing Musafaha because, oh, you're not meeting my hands, it's Eid, Eid, Eid time, like we've got the Eid reward, then it's wrong. But if it's not for Eid and you're just doing it because you just, that's fine, inshallah. Is it more preferable to pray for Nafil instead of Eid in Jama'ah or individual or for, for family of four or both the same? It's all complicated. This. Better to pray for Nafil instead of Eid in Jama'ah or individual. Like I said, the, the view I follow is that we shouldn't be praying Eid. So I say just pray Nafa. There'll be some scholars who will say you can pray Eid. The New Testament is better to pray Eid or better to pray Nafa. Why do we need four male adults for Eid Salah? Like I'm saying no Eid Salah. So that's not a question for me. Uh, I'm saying you should be praying Nafa. So if someone is allowing it at home, then you need to ask them the question that why you're saying four males, can two males and two females not suffice? That's a view, that's a question for them. Okay, inshallah, I think we'll leave it to that. Uh, whatever you do, don't go into debates and discussions about Eid, just smile and have a good Eid. Uh, like I said, Spend the last day. Well, still, Eid is still away. We still got two more. Where is it tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday? At least, you know, one more day or two days. Still to fast, worshiping Allah. Uh, and inshallah, make lots of dua and fast. And you know, try to do as much ibadah as you can. And then when Eid comes, then inshallah, worship Allah Eid night, like I said. And then pray together as a family, Fajr Salah. There, definitely, you don't have, you don't need females. Uh, males, sorry. <laughs> and you can have just two people, one, you and your wife, husband, Allah. Just a, such a romantic salah with Allah and you and your wife and your husband. I'm just looking forward to that Fajr Salah on eight day, inshallah. You really enjoy it. And then after that, if you're going, if you're following the opinion, pray it salah, pray it. If you're following the opinion that you don't pray it salah, pray nothing, not really a problem. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.